Welcome, folks. I'm Chris Neidl. I am the co-founder of the Open Air Collective, and I'm welcoming you. I'm in Sharm El Sheikh right now at uh, COP27. Thank you for joining this virtual recording. Incredibly excited uh, now. I think this is the fourth installment that has been on the Carbon Removals at COP website under the Carbon Crowd category. And Carbon Crowd is a project of open airs where we're taking innovative CDR concepts that arise from our open source community and trying to build a larger audience and larger uh, body of participants to hyper evolve those projects. And today we have an incredibly cool one. I'm very excited to be joined by the core founding team of AirSynth, which is a incredibly cool open source carbon removal slash capture and utilization project that was started by Anirudh Sharma. Hey, Anirudh, how you doing? I'm good, Chris. How are you? Excellent. And I'm also joined by Two really, really smart and curious and interested guys who are excited to contribute from very sort of different areas where, where they do their own work. Uh, we have Alex Ose, who is a very active open air member based in Oregon. Hey, Alex, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? And we have Mike Damashak, who is in North Carolina. Mike, how you doing? Good. How's it going? Excellent. Great. So what we're going to do today, as we've done in the previous crowd, uh, Carbon Crowd, uh, episodes for Carbon Removals at COP is we'll have Annie Root is actually going to talk, uh, give you a bit of a presentation on the background of this project, its origins, uh, what we're trying to achieve. And then the four of us are going to have uh, really a conversation based on uh, what 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 Annie Root has put forward. And we're going to talk about the direction that we're trying to take this project in. But most importantly, we're this is really a call to action. We're inviting people who find this interesting to become participants in this program, as you'll hear in a second. This is really going to work with the more participation we have for many, many people contributing their ideas and their different perspectives. So so let's go ahead and, and kick off. Uh, Anirudh, uh, you have a short presentation for us to go through to kind of set the stage. So if you want to share your screen. Right away. Yes. All right. So uh, hi, my name is Anirudh Sharma, and uh, I have... I'm a I'm the co-founder of Gravity Labs. Uh, we I've, I've been in carbon sequestration, turning carbon into new materials for like last four years. My background is electrical engineering and the fusion of industrial design, and I really like to take applied science and and mix it with social impact and turn it into not profits or companies. Basically, take it out there from the lab into the real world. So today we're going to talk talk we're going to be talking about AirSynth. Uh, what we are talking about here is how to make this hello world of carbon capture easy and accessible for people beyond their highly equipped labs. Like how do you bring it down from the big labs into the hands of people who can who actually want to get started with carbon capture? Now, why open source? Um, if you see if if you look about if you see the whole open source movement, it has touched the computer science, so whole like Mozilla, Chromium, Red Hat, uh, Fedora, they're all open source projects. It has even come down to biology. Now you see community biohacker spaces where high school students, kids, uh, design students, they're all hacking with biology, thinking about like growing bio biospheres in their backyards and so on. And it's, it has happened because a lot of abstraction on that complex biology that required really complex labs has now been simplified and open sourced through these tools that are easy, really easy uh, to hack on. And because of that, a lot of startups have come out of it and teaching bio and thinking about like the world as not just from like bits and bytes, it's also like organisms has become possible. We want to do the same thing for carbon capture. And the current state of uh, and a little bit about my personal journey with open source. Um, this is one of the prototypes when I was, I used to live in Bangalore uh, uh, and uh, I had this idea that, hey, what if we made a shoe for the blind that could help them navigate from one place to another? Because I lived a lot around the visually impaired areas. And so what enabled me from that idea to a prototype to test what those visually impaired people was, I went to the market, picked up an Arduino lily pad. It had just come out. And I did not know how to build microcontrollers. I just knew how to build on top of it. So I went and bought in a few vibrational motors. And from what it looks like this prototype, after a couple of years, it turned into a final product that actual people, visually impaired people were using. All of this wouldn't have been possible if Arduino LilyPad wasn't an open source project for me to build upon. Uh, so that's where my personal journey with open source uh, has sort of begun. Now, coming back to carbon capture, this is what like a lab in 
working in like electrochemistry or any type of carbon capture would look like. They're expensive, complex, because the current, most of the technologies in carbon capture, they are around high temperatures and pressures. And the, the interesting thing is right now, the chemical um, in chemical engineering, now electrochemistry has reached a point that it's possible to look at carbon capture from room temperature and pressure scales. So what we are planning in this project is to simplify all of that in a way that not just scientists, but kids, high schoolers, like community participants, like makerspaces can get involved in carbon capture, not just from talking perspective, but also like doing perspective. So there's a need to build those tools for them to get started. And that is what this project is all about. So the idea is to finish this framework that we are building. We have a prototype right now and distributed as kits uh, is a rough plan to a lot of makerspaces through collaborations of the open air community and uh, makerspaces around the world to sort of have an invitation, which we'll talk about going further in the presentation. So, so think of air synth like this reactor that emulates artificial photosynthesis as a process. Like there is the, the three input streams are carbon dioxide, sun and humidity or water. And by using a special catalyst fused between an anode and a cathode, we get the output of uh, C1, C2 molecules, which is essentially the building block of all the materials around us, which is essentially what carbon capture and utilization is all about. So we are in the early stages of building out this reactor. We have a cell design. We have tried to play around with a few catalysts. And uh, uh, this is what it looks like. So it's an electrochemical workbench. This is the cell that we're talking about. Um, we have already figured out the manufacturing for it, the cat catalyst making process for it. So we started building this out as an open source project during during COVID. A uh, bunch of electrochemistry friends, they came together and uh, we took a lab and we started looking at this whole idea of using carbon dioxide, which is carbon emissions, ambient sunlight and humidity as raw materials to creating useful products which means like using the CO2 to make useful products and carbon capture and utilization. Um, how it works is there is a membrane and a catalyst uh, fused between an anode and a cathode that enables the proton transfer from the water and fuse it with the carbon molecule from CO2 and turn it into C1, C2 products. This is very cutting edge electrochemistry, but doable. We have had good results by producing, in producing, very basic electrochemical outputs like formic acid, ethanol, and ethylene. But these things are hard. They are very cutting edge. Um, but the, 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 the vision is to be able to create these precursors for the most important industrial materials around us by using carbon capture. And this cell that you see, that the prototype that you see, enables in creating that type of a framework that enables this type of output. Um, Currently, what we have is this cell, the catalyst, and the membrane, and we are planning on optimizing the results and creating this cell that we can distribute to the rest of the community. That's great. And just a bit of history real quick, Anirudh, if you can, obviously, you started off with that amazing early project that you worked on, the, the shoe for, uh, for the visually impaired, um, but you have a quite a a career history of working on a lot of very cool projects and you're very, very much part of the open source uh, world. But can you tell us a little bit about, you know, a year ago or so, like where did the idea, why did you uh, sort of come to this idea? What sort of sparked the, the interest in it and, and who did you work with to get it to this point? Right. So uh, uh, I had a friend who was uh, uh, from electrochemistry background back in India. It was full COVID lockdown. And we were looking at amazing research happening in the space of electrochemistry and like car enabling carbon capture from uh, at room temperature and pre pressure. And by seeing these type of developments, we got super excited that do we have the tools in India, in a small town in Jaipur, to be able to put this prototype together. So we started talking to our machinist friends to, to uh, machine like grade two titanium to build this cell out. Then we ordered a few catalysts through our friends sitting in other different parts of the world and started to uh, use the sol gel method to actually build those catalysts out, create the catalyst ink and coat it. And we found, uh, and at the university that we were collaborating with, we found uh, 
uh, the GCMS and all the analytical tools to do this chemistry and analysis. All of this happened during COVID in a very distributed manner from friends helping from all around the world with catalysts, with equipment and uh, getting these results out. Uh, then I moved back uh, recently, back to uh, MIT. We, I like everybody on this call are people that we have been working with, but we have never met. But the cell is already out from our hand, like my hand, the, the hands of my team. And I already shipped it out to Chris. And right now, a larger team of electrochemists is getting involved in building it out further. We have a path to go ahead in this. And once these results are polished, we will plan to make a... a an open source version that is affordable and hackable for the rest of the community. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we'll, we'll really stress when you think about things through an open source lens, it's really about creating that first coherent, as we call a kernel, right? The most basic functioning type of unit, the hello world type of version of this. And we think that that is the thing that can really get it into the hands of many people to make much, much more complex things. Right. You mentioned a team of friends that you had. I met some of those people over the last year when you first began working on this. Now you have two new, more recent friends uh, who are on the call with us right now. And I was wondering right. to bring in uh, Alex and Mike. I'd love, Alex, I know your background and what you've been working on. So I'm wondering if you could start, what kind of drew you to this project as an open air member and how does it relate to some of the other stuff that you're working on? Yeah, well, I think I can speak for everyone at Open Air that people are extremely excited about this. Uh, I know I was when I first heard about it. Um, and yeah, quick background. So I've been involved with Open Air for about a year. And I found it because I literally just Googled open source carbon carbon capture. It was the first thing that came up. Uh, it was actually a project called Violet, which is still in flight. Super cool. Check it out. Um and yeah, I just, uh, I come from a software engineering background and I was like, you know, I just want to go build stuff. Like, what can I do right now? And um, yeah, so I, I started looking at some of the projects that were already going at Open Air. And they were mostly kind of on like the, the sorbent side, like actually pulling carbon out of the air. There wasn't so much an answer for what to do with the concentrated carbon dioxide once we got it. So that's when I kind of started going down my own path of, what are some things we could we could actually do with this? Um, I started looking at all sorts of research and I went down almost exactly the same path as you did, where I was like, well, we can't do high temperature and pressure. You know, we can't do things that have crazy exotic materials in them. You know, what's something that someone could build at home where you could take in a stream of CO2 and make something out of it? Um, and yeah, I came to some of the same conclusions. It was like, Electrochemistry, room temperature, pressure, um, not super expensive materials. I mean, of course, there's there's platinum and titanium and in certain types of um, in uh, catalysts and such. But um, the thing that I really gravitated towards was this idea of using copper, some kind of copper related catalyst uh, and maybe making something like ethanol, something that was relatively right. safe something that was useful, uh, precursor in a lot of different industrial processes. So uh, yeah, when we met um, and I saw the first version of the electrolyzer, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Uh, all these different pieces that all kind of like I was still learning about. I mean, it took me months and months and months to read all these papers and try to understand it. Uh, suddenly, you know, I had this great resource of people that were actually experts and could actually, you know, point me in the right direction. So, uh, yeah, yeah, super, super excited about it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that I can uh, help share what I've learned as well. Um, I went out and started buying all the pieces I need. I just got like a like a commercial electrolyzer from fuelcellstore.com uh, that I've basically been hacking on. Um, not quite as fancy as, as what you've made, but, uh, you know, first step, you know, so. Yeah, that's great. Well, Alex, um, so I'm going to just, you know, somewhat artificially here kind of, you know, archetypically, like our team here is made up of different types of people, obviously. I, don't get me anywhere near a laboratory. You guys know I'm more of a cheerleader than anything. But uh, you're really, you know, a type of person you could really consider a hacker. You're really kind of an independent turkey who likes to make things. And there are thousands of such people uh, around the world who actually can make really, really cool things that aren't novelty. So we're very much trying to tap into 
uh, that world and, and activate that community. That's certainly a community that Ani Rudy is very acquainted with. And now to turn to Mike, Mike, you're a much more recent member. I think you joined, you know, maybe six weeks ago and we started to talk about the projects that were happening in open air. And I sort of presented a number of them to you and you really um, sort of zoomed in on this one. You said, I really want to work on this one. And um, so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what interested you in the project, but also you're finishing up your undergraduate degree uh, in chemistry. And I wonder if you could try to give us a sense, you've been talking to some of your other students and it sounds like you're you're seeing a lot of interest uh, in this project uh, from others. And we're seeing this in the other universities that we're working with. So yeah, tell us a little bit about your interest in the project and uh, why you think that this could be something that maybe universities could play and university students could play a major uh, role in evolving. Yeah, so I think what uh, my experience and my interest in this project is mainly focused on the ability for this to make um, products that people can use and it's very tangible things. And it also gets people introduced to chemistry, um, you know, electrochemistry, things like that uh, in a very simple way. And I think it's a way to broaden um, and get more people into the space working with chemi chemistry and not taking it from something that is very uh, over their head feeling and bringing it very more personal and making people uh, or allowing people to work with you know, basic chemistry principles. Um, but I think that around campus as well, uh, I think that people are looking to work on environmental things. A lot of people care about the environment. Environmental science is one of the um, most popular degrees. And recently I sent out a interest form about the carbon removal challenge and got like 20 responses within a couple of days. Um, so there's definitely the want and desire to work on projects like this. And especially in uh, UNC Chapel Hill has a maker space. And so there are the hackers around campus and they, I think most people want a community to work with and to kind of work on these hard problems that um, are being done in laboratory spaces. So bringing that from, you know, uh, from a laboratory that uses expensive equipment and then just bring it to the Arduino kind of style or democratizing it basically. Um, it's the coolest thing to me. And I think that would excite a lot of people on campus as well. Yeah, and if we think if, if that's any indicator and we're seeing this again, there's three other universities that we're engaged with who, if you follow this project and get involved, you will, you will meet folks from there and from other universities. But if you could just imagine if your university is not atypical, how many minds and hours and commitments uh, could be made. And I really want to stress that this might seem quirky to some people who are not used to this way of developing things, but we we really fully believe that this could be a key to breakthroughs in carbon removal. This is this other universe that has materialized since the internet and has matured over the last two decades and has really come to a real point of maturity right now that this can really drive change in the world. Um, so this isn't uh, just a sort of a science fair project. This is something that's the beginning of something that we think could be quite massive. Um, one thing I wanted to um, really quickly also point out in terms of the terms we're using, we're talking about, we're using the word carbon capture a lot and carbon capture and utilization. And for some people, they associate that with, you know, large industrial capture systems at smokestacks and then large industrial systems to make chemicals and things like that. Um, certainly that is related here, but carbon, open air is a carbon removal community where a lot of DAC enthusiasts, uh, we have open source DAC projects we've been working on for two years. So we look at this as something that can be integrated with direct air capture. So taking carbon, removing it from the air and then turning it into durable, uh, things. Uh, so just to be, um, just to be clear on that. So I wonder if, um, Anirud, if we can talk a little bit, what's cool about this is we want to get it to a point where there's a functional unit that will always be able to be improved upon. It will never be done. Uh, there will always be uh, evolution of this, but we wanna get it to a point where it can be that building block that then liberates other people to think creatively about Absolutely. removing carbon and then making stuff out of it. So we'll talk about that in a second in terms of our dream there. But right now we're at really a, an immediate stage where we, we really need to validate certain things and we wanna bring in a community to help us with that uh, at universities and hackers as well. So let's start with that. Where are we right now with the project in terms of what do we need to know in order to really go live with this, make it open source and really open up the gates? 
Right. So like just starting with the analogy, like right now, what we're trying to make it is this sort of a kernel, this microcontroller around which so many creative and different type of use cases can be built. Um, in terms of development, we and we also developed this like in a in an open source way. So most of this development was done by uh, one electrochemist on our team, Dr. Ajay Seni, who was also enamored by the vision of open sourcing what he does in the lab. The cells were made in a makerspace in Jaipur called FabMat by a friend of mine, Mohit. So and and we paid for like he was a contributor to the project, didn't charge us a thing. Uh, had we done this as a company, it would have taken us millions of dollars to reach to this point. Now that now where we are technically in terms of now the good thing is now there's a good and bad uh and the good thing is we made a lot of progress by spending very little money uh by the different contributors coming and contributing their know-how in making this current setup what you see here on the screen right now this core cell but in terms of testing right now we are facing some challenges in kind of making claims out there on the efficiency of the catalyst, efficiency of the membrane. So we are currently looking for those collaborators that can kind of like help us from this sort of works. Are these the correct specs? Will this catalyst get poisoned in like after two months of operations? We want to do that testing stage before we launch it out to the community in a very, very distributed fashion. So those parts are yet to be figured out right now, but I would say we have the building blocks, all, all of these coming together, a great set of like contributors coming on this project. So yeah, I would say that final finishing touches to compiling it, it requires that domain expertise right now uh, that we are looking for contributors for right now. Yeah, Chris. And that's one of the benefits of the university partners. If you have student interests, you don't only have interest, but you have proximity to high levels of expertise with faculty, and also close proximity to laboratory equipment that will actually help us hopefully fill in those blanks and do that validation. And, yeah. and the good thing, good thing is each of us on this call, we are not electrochemists and we are like trying, like even, even me, but we are trying to collaborate and put this whole thing together so that other people like us from different backgrounds get, get to participate in carbon capture by using this current kind of kernel. So just to add to your point, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's such a such a good point too, which is uh, we are an electrochemist. Uh, we are uh, we're at its core we're hardware hackers, um, and that's something that I think uh, you know anyone who's uh, listening to this who isn't um, who hasn't hacked on electrochemical cells, um, which is probably most people. Um, yeah, you you run into this problem pretty quickly, which is uh, you need really accurate measurement tools uh, to measure both the input and the output if you're going to validate your claims, uh, which is something that people don't typically have in their houses. Uh, there's there's some exceptions uh, of certain types of sensors you can get that are affordable. But for the sort of broad validation that you need to say, hey, this thing works and this thing does what we says it does. Uh, yeah, now we're talking about uh, you know, expensive uh, NMR machines and, and GCs and things like that that most people won't have in their garage. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's where finding um, different types of partners um, in academia and industry would be so helpful for us. Um, and I think those people are out there as well. Um, oh, so, they're out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's just yeah. such a high level of interest, you know. Um, again, I'm I'm a guy who works really on open air's advocacy wing. We do very similar things with policy. We take a similar approach where we bring in a lot of people to develop legislation, uh, in you know, but very similar uh, core principles. Um, I think one of the things that's really exciting. You just had the slide up a minute ago, uh, Ani Rude, where there was a little tiny solar cell that was sitting on top, and obviously we're going to look to make this as uh, using renewable energy and you know conscious in the long term of having this be, you know, obviously low energy and highly efficient. But I come from a solar background, is that folks know here. And one of the things that I spent 15 years in solar, uh, my whole career before getting into carbon removal, and I worked in many different contexts. I was in New York City. I was in the Redwoods of California. I was in India. I was in Afghanistan. I was in uh, the Philippines. I was in Kenya. And I had this interesting thing where I was able to see solar, almost there was local cultures around solar that we're able to think creatively about how to use it. And that I think is really an underrated and very core reason why solar has been success so successful. And one of the reasons why that was is because of the simplicity of the cell. If solar was even slightly more complex or 
the minimal deployable unit of it slightly larger, then it you wouldn't have had that, what I call social creativity. The smaller and simpler the core unit comes, the more that it can interact with minds. Uh, it becomes socially creative. Uh, with large nuclear power plants, they're not socially creative because nobody can do anything with them. But when you have something that's like a Lego block, like what air synth is or what like a solar cell is, it triggers the imagination. And that's really what we're kind of going for, I think. Can we trigger the imagination? And with open source, you can't cheat. You can't pretend you know where it's going. You don't know where it's going. Uh, you trust that the collective imagination and the size and diversity of your community will forge those new directions. So I just want to, again, underscore, that's the way we think about things when we think about open source, whether it's for technology or legislation or for something else. That's very powerfully said, yeah, Chris, like how do you create these systems so that like a GitHub of a repository where anybody can fork and create their own version, that's super powerful. And that is what democratizes technology in different parts of the world. Solar panels, somebody invented and made it simple. And now you go to Afghanistan, you go to the poorest parts of India, you will find people using it in the ways that that inventor of solar panel would have never thought. So that's like, that's what we want to do for like carbon capture. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's the classic sort of like Marshall McLuhan was a, a big influence of mine from a very early age. Uh, the, you know, very famous 20th century technology and media scholar. And he talks about how technology called the media, but he was talking about technology more broadly, how whatever you think the thing is going to do when you start, you're almost always wrong because you're looking through the rear view mirror. He says, you think you're looking forward through the windshield, but you're actually looking through the rear view mirror and you're framing your expectations based on what you think the closest sort of technology is. But in reality, technologies unfold in real life through constant interaction with people. And they often defy the expectations. They're just full of sort of surprises. And again, the more simple and accessible you make that kernel, the more likely is you're going to have those happy accidents, as we say, as parents or those, those surprises, and they take you in directions that you don't expect. So, and I'm sure Alex and, and maybe Mike, you know, and certainly Annie Rude, like you guys probably in your own lives or your own study of open source and of hacking, you probably have many examples of that, you know, about how, again, things sort of wend their way into unexpected directions and that can change things uh, in ways that we never anticipated. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, software. It's uh, there's there's so many examples. The, the one that comes to mind is uh, Node.js. Um, it was basically just one person, Ryan. His name's Ryan Dahl. Uh, you know, had this idea to kind of plug this into this, and like, oh, this is kind of cool. I might use it. And then because he released it in an open source license, um, Node.js is everywhere. I mean, uh, so many new software products are written. On Node.js, um, of course, there's a lot of development that happened in the meantime. But um, yeah, and, and to your point, Chris, uh, the reason why it worked is because it was simple. It was easy for people to understand and it was accessible, um, accessible in terms of license, accessible in terms of code. You could go look at it. You could see how it worked, see if it suits your needs or not. Um, and here we are, you know, about 10 years later. Um, and yeah, if I were, uh, you know, if I were someone who was uh, starting a company based on carbon utilization uh, and I could start with this as a building block that would maybe cut you know six months a year of research off of my off of you know my R&D time I, I'd basically just hit the ground running so yeah it, it could be a, such an important part of establishing an industry around uh, carbon utilization and let's let's acquaint uh, viewers who who will not be familiar with some of the terms we've used or some of even our assumptions uh, from an open source perspective. Uh, one quick thing that you just mentioned, uh, Ani Rood, you, you talked about GitHub, and we very shortly, Open Air's GitHub will be expanded. All of the things that we make, whether it's legislation or things, will be on there. Can you just explain to the audience what GitHub is, or Alex, or, or whoever would just give people a sense of what that is? Alex, you want to go for it? You're the software oh. guy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, GitHub is based off of a tool called Git, uh, which lets people essentially share and version their, their code. It, it was, it's really meant for software. But now people use it for all sorts of things. Uh, anything where multiple people are collaborating on something, um, a lot of times they'll use Git to sort of share the different versions and the different changes that get made to it. Uh, a GitHub takes all that and it puts it on the web for anyone with a web browser to look at and participate in. 
Yeah. And again, I've seen, I know it started with software as another, another intellectual hero of mine is a guy named David Deutsch. I uh, wrote a great book called the beginning of infinity, but he talks about the jump to universality for certain types of innovations, whether it's alphabets or numbers or anything that they sometimes start with very parochial, narrow focus that the inventor of it thought it was just like, like language was just for, or numbers was just for tallying grain and, you know, in an ancient civilization, but with a little bit of a tweaks to the rules, it becomes universal. It can be used for many, many different things. And I think we're entering a phase where open source is very much thought about around software and it's been very successful with software, but there's really nothing stopping with a few tweaks or even sort of introducing different types of people to make open source jump to universality to something where you can make any kind of thing uh, out of open source and you can use a tool like GitHub in order to do it. One other thing, if you guys could all answer this, one of the things that sometimes people scratch their heads about, particularly if they come from sort of a, you know, a sort of a more traditional commercial sort of model that so much of open source is just driven by the love of the project. People are intrinsically motivated to make a thing better. It's not part of a labor market necessarily. It's just you get rapid improvement through voluntary mass participation. Can you explain to people like, what, what is the psychology by that? And can you just validate that that's a real thing for those of you who are not familiar? Like, why do people pitch into it? Why do people want to just keep making things better and not get paid for it? Cool. Uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, I was going to say that, at least for me, it was uh, kind of an access point, at least into carbon capture. You know, I was looking at a lot of jobs and trying to figure out how to do things. And it's like, well, why don't I just make one of these myself? Because I'm, I'm interested in doing this. I want to... Um, you know, capture carbon, <laughs> you know, why don't I just do this myself and figure it out? And especially with the carbon removal challenge, um, I think with that, there's a lot of interest because people are interested in doing that and they want to learn how to design these new technologies and they want to do things so they can have the outcomes of like helping the environment get better, kind of. And quickly, just the carbon removal challenge, which I'm excited, Michael, you've referred to twice. We're going to have a carbon crowd uh, which will premiere Wednesday on the carbon removal uh, at COP Virtual Pavilion. That is a um, a university challenge or competition that Open Air's co-founder Matt Parker has been heading up. We're hoping to have many, many different universities, almost like a solar decathlon. If people are familiar with that, let's get as many university teams around the world entering in novel ideas around distributed carbon removal. And so this is going to be sort of like a big challenge that will be um, sort of the focal point of it, New York University, but universities all over the world. So keep your eye out and look at the carbon removals uh, at COP calendar for that uh, in the second week. Um, but yeah, Alex and, um, and Anirudh, I didn't know if you just more, more generally about how does this whole thing work? Because it's so counterintuitive, I think, for people who think about sort of, you know, incentives and, you know, uh, you know, the ways that the products normally are made and sold and distributed open air kind of breaks that model a little bit because much of it is again driven by volunteer love or fascination with the project yeah i think that's such a good thing to focus on uh and the question i always hear is you know who makes money uh and there's a there's a long and winding answer to that it depends on your product it depends on what you're trying to make uh but what keeps it going? Yeah, it's that it's that love of uh, of making making progress and advancing the uh, the art form. I think at its core. But with carbon capture, carbon removal specifically, uh, I know a lot of people like myself um, who are environmentally minded who learned about offsets and thought, oh, great, like cool offsets. That's something you can buy on the other side of the world and and they're not that expensive and it'll you know that that'll solve all all of our problems. And then we all sort of learned that like maybe offsets aren't all they cracked up to be. Um, maybe they're a little bit too vague. Maybe it doesn't actually solve the problem we think it's trying to solve. So I know for me, how I ended up here and how I ended up so excited about open source carbon removal is uh, I want something in front of me that I can that I can see working. Um, this is like a problem that I want to solve. Uh, I, I want to, you know, be hands-on here and not just trust that like oh maybe maybe someone on on a different part of the planet can like solve this problem for me or maybe it's going to happen maybe it won't um i really wanted to turn into something tangible for myself so that's kind of how i ended up here and i think that's true of a lot of people uh, at open air as well 
Like yeah. even if you see the whole revolution in like three D printing, like Chris, that's your favorite topic, right? All of that revolution in three D printing was seeded by open source, and that made three D printing what it is today. And that started like ten, fifteen years ago. I mean, the technology has been around for like last thirty, forty years, but it was this open source movement that brought three D printing to like every small space around the world and got kids to think about like physical forms and making things. Had this whole idea of like the future factory where things are produced in a decentralized fashion. Yeah. And 3D printing is definitely something people who come in here is of great interest to us. I think we've even talked about uh, some of the academic literature we've looked at about 3D printing some of the components of this, about some of the outputs of it could actually be potentially utilized in uh, 3D printing filaments. So an early project we might be able to have once we get this functioning is, can we actually integrate this with desktop 3D printing where you're producing some inputs for that material. So you're literally printing uh, with material that has carbon from the air in it, which I think is will capture a lot of people's imagination. Alex, you just said something too that I think is really important about, and this is a fundamental open air thing. This is our whole theory of the case here is that a lot of times people who are struggling with climate change and the fear of it are not necessarily, they don't know where they fit into the options that are presented to them. It's often about how as consumers, you just mentioned offsets or Maybe they go to a march every once in a while. And open air is based on the idea that there's just incalculable latent potential in the global public to be directly engaged if you give the opportunity to make things, to bring who they are and what they know how to do and make things better faster. And that's why we think in carbon removal, we can really do that. And it's one thing if 3D printing captured the imagination. You mentioned it came from modest origins. It was absolutely an open source project. And now it's evolved into this really a world changing new part of our of our industrial uh, reality. But when you think of climate change, there are so many, such a billions of people that are concerned about this, that you could just only imagine the size of the community that would be intrinsically motivated to contribute to something like this and other open source projects and op other open air projects, if really given the vehicle and the opportunity to do so. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. And I, I think comparing it to the early days of 3D printing, or I also think of maybe the early days of VR, uh, where uh, that, those yeah. movements started, uh, those were people just talking back and forth on a forum. It wasn't super polished. There, were, there weren't companies, you know, putting up millions of dollars to, to help fund these, these hacker projects. But uh, little by little, people made progress and people developed... Uh, you know, pieces, uh, they, they solve pieces of the problem. And then all of a sudden, one day, it all comes together. And a few years later, you can buy a 3D printer for 200 bucks off the shelf, or you can buy a, you know, pair of VR goggles for 300 or, you know, whatever. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I see a lot of similarities to those early days. Um, and I think it can be a little intimidating to get started sometimes just because, you know, uh, it, it's early. There's a lot of there's a lot of cross chatter. There's a lot of different people working on different things, but uh, but the the energy and the enthusiasm is is certainly there. And, and you mentioned a thing there that is really important is that what open source is particularly good at is it's almost like a primordial ooze of creativity and what we call productification, right? Where even the most risk averse, you know, visionary entrepreneur might not want to touch a certain idea because they're still sort of locked into the idea of how am I ultimately going to be able to make a profit for this? And that's how I will grow. And that is, you know, obviously a powerful driver of change. But before that, there's the people who are just playfully, creatively, for the love of solving problems, for care of climate change in this case, that they're the breadth of their vision and their willingness to think and do things, not because they know ultimately they have to answer to a consumer or an investor, they're just trying to figure things out. And that can bring things to a, it can productify. It can bring it to something that's coherent enough where it does have a place actually in the market. But it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't, again, that primordial ooze uh, of the of the open source hacker beforehand. And the history of that is not well known to much of the public, but so many of the things that shape our everyday life have that origin in the tech space, actually. And one thing I wanted to also say, Mike, you know, I was talking to you early on when you first joined and you're obviously really into science. You, you want to be core focused on the development of this. And then you mentioned, I believe, a friend or maybe it was even your girlfriend who is more of sort of an activist than on other other side of the sort of the spectrum. And you're like, well, maybe she can get involved in open air. 
But I should say, even for this project, someone like me who knows nothing about what I'm looking at on the screen right now, I'm not, that's not my world, but there are many different roles that can happen. You know, we envision, we need graphic designers. We need people who can help us tell the story of this. We need what we call recruiters, where people like Alex and Mike and Annie Rood can define a particular need and the recruiter will go out into the world with that brief and try to bring more people in. So there's actually, if you don't see yourself in the core hard tech part of this, in order to really get this out into the world, it requires a whole other set of, of skills. So if you're interested in this, there is a role for you. And I should mention in the show notes, when you look at it, there's a form that we have there. If this is something you want to find out more about and you want to be a participant at these earliest stages, give us your email, give us your name, tell us where you are, and uh, we'll be in touch and we'll we'll bring you right into the fold. Absolutely. Yeah, there's really no skill that we can't not a use at yeah. this point. Yeah. We yeah, everything has been done like so quickly uh, just to get those results that er they're, they're, that as soon as we arrive at those results, there are like 100 other problems waiting to be solved. Example would be like, how do you make this cell thinner, lighter, more easily reproducible? How do we reduce the bomb? So industrial design, DFM, manufacturing engineering, uh, and of course, electrochemistry, catalyst development, all of these skills like are required in this project, just like Chris said, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the true beauty of like open source is that there's no requirements and anyone can kind of join and just try to help out any way they can. So especially with this project too being so early. Yeah, there might even be a thing where almost a, a, an analog to what we were talking about before about because you present this kernel to the world, it activates people to say, oh, I can use it in this way. I can use it in that way. And then that that is completely unpredictable. Somebody out there and Salt Lake City or somebody in Jakarta will look at this and have a totally other idea. And if that's shared with the community, that can that can be a, a, a real course change or forge a new direction. The same goes for people who come in with who they are. What is your skill? It could be completely non-technical. You might have some ability, some connection to another person that when you come in and you make that known, that gets thrown into the pot and that might take things in a different direction as well. So I just really wanna underscore this. This is a truly open project. So I think we're kind of getting towards the end here. This has been great, guys. You can tell by my, my level of enthusiasm here, which I think we all share. I, I'm extremely excited about AirSynth. And I, I really want to give Ani Rood, if you only knew uh, the effort that he's put into this, uh, I've been talking to him for a year about it and him and his team and uh, really just got to give you an enormous amount of credit, Ani Rood, for, for bringing this in. It is actually the friends and like people interested in this, like in very unfamiliar places, just like yourself. Like I would like to thank like, Dr. Ajay Saini in the full lockdown in the summers of Rajasthan, Jaipur, like his own lab, very little resources, but he pulled it off. Like the, the other maker spaces in, in India that came together, Mohit's lab in FabMat, like, yeah. So it's been done in a very collaborative fashion and this is how it's progressing further. So thank you everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And I think right now we probably have a, hard to say, again, we can't, over promise or anything like that. I think we're, we have some very clear next steps and some excellent collaborators to do some of that sort of hard validation right now. But, you know, I would like to see when we roll around to COP28 and we have this webinar from then that we can say we have dozens of university teams. We have hundreds of hackers like Alex that are all over the world that are plugged into this and that are in love with this project and are really uh, embraced it and are committed to making it something really awesome. And I think by sometimes these things move very fast in open source, you know, there's fits and starts, but hopefully we can report back uh, by next year. Um, and this slide that we're looking at right now, will have images on there that will look a hell of a lot different. <laughs> so that's the hope, but we're about to start that ride and we want as many people as possible uh, to participate. So if this struck a chord with you, or even if you just want to find out more, uh, we're going to be missionizing this, as we say, in open air. Right now, it's been sort of a bit under wraps with just a few of us. But uh, probably in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll make this more public within our Discord channel, which will allow anybody to kind of join. And so if you want to come in, you can hop right in and, you know, let's see where we can take this. Anything else from you guys? Any other final thoughts about your expectations or hopes or, you know, big ideas uh, about where this might go between now and COP28? Love it. Uh, yeah, I, I would just say, uh, yeah, please, please join the Discord. Uh, the more people, the better. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's 
I think everyone's right. This is this is the sort of project that really can spark the imagination. Uh, can imagine uh, taking taking CO two out of the air, which everyone wants us to do, and actually making it. I mean, making making stuff out of thin air. It's uh, it's it's a pretty pretty magical uh, concept, and uh, yeah, we could we could use we could use everyone's help in making it a reality. Yeah, and Mike. Uh, yeah, I think this is just a really cool project, and I hope it gets to a place where people can just like work with these things in their rooms and very simply learn chemistry and capture carbon from the air. And yeah, awesome. And Andrew, yeah. I'm gonna let you close this out since this is your baby. Uh, what do you no. want to see this be like in a year? Yeah, the baby is growing, is going out of my hands now. <laughs> so one of the artists, he, uh, a friend of mine, he came to me and said that the, the moment that you guys have this figured out zero to one, I want to build an installation in the middle of a desert where there's nothing, but actually show there's a lot. There's CO2, there's sun, and there's humidity. And can we make things out of carbon in the middle of the desert and thin air? If you figure that out, I'll I'll build that installation. So that that excites us, right? That collaboration. That if we build out this kernel in Lego, there are so many possibilities to do with by collaborating with other communities. So well, thank you, Chris. What yeah. you just said there, maybe that's a thing we can talk about relatively soon and talk to your friend. Is that going to be in in Rajasthan or which which desert are we talking? It about? Any, it could be the Sahara Desert. It could be yeah. any desert. Like yeah, like maybe in the Middle East, we can show how to make fuels not from the ground but from the air. Like you know. Yeah. <laughs> Great. No, well, guys, I'm, I'm so excited about this project. I'm so grateful for Anirudh and for Alex and for Mike to jump in. And again, there are others who are, who are not on this call who have already started to trickle in. So let's see where it takes us. But thank you all for tuning in. And we hope to see you on the Discord. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.